And now, Orthodoxy with Connor Mortel in Trailer Park, Chesterton. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. This is uh, just going to be my little I'm going to start doing on Caleb's channel here at Thomas Reviews. I'm very grateful to him for giving me this little corner to work out my own things. Basically what this is, I recently joined, when I moved to Florida, my local Chesterton Society chapter, and I'm very new to it, so don't take too much of my word for it on what it is, but so far it's more or less a Chesterton book club where we just review various Chesterton readings very little at a time, and when I joined, I reached out to Caleb to see if he would mind if I just, every month after we meet, go over what it is we've read uh it'll be very bite-sized things it'll probably just be once a month three or four chapters of some sort of chesterton reading so if you're if you're interested in chesterton it'll be a quick and easy bite-sized readings once a month uh if you're really interesting you'll interested you'll be beyond able to read faster than the rate at which this podcast is going to go in a lot of ways, it's just going to be kind of me keeping my own notes of what it was I went over, but I wanted to be able to share that with this and to actually be able to contribute to Thomas Reviews for once. So I just intend to, once a month, typically the second or third week of the month, go over whatever it was we just read. Right now, what we're starting for the new year is Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. If you are not familiar with it, it is largely considered one of Chesterton's best and most popular works. It was written the same year as another one of his most popular books, The Man Who Was Thursday, A Nightmare, and it was written in 1908. He actually has said at points that the two of them tell very similar stories, and what the story is is how Chesterton came to find Orthodox Christianity and use that as his creed by which he lives his life. Uh, Thursday is obviously a fiction piece where it's much more dream sequency. It's a little more subtle than orthodoxy. Chesterton's never super subtle, but it's it, it's still more so than that. It, but it is dealing with the ideas of good and evil and how he came to that. Uh, orthodoxy was also written before Chesterton's conversion, which is interesting because if you read it, it's very difficult to find lines in which you would not, as a Catholic, agree with everything he said. I'm sure a smarter man than I could easily find things and whatnot, but the majority of people, you break it down, and it is a very Catholic work. And it's been responsible for tons of conversions to Catholicism, including some of the people I actually met with this week converted to Catholicism after reading Orthodoxy, even though he wrote it before he had converted to Catholicism himself. Um, with that, we'll dive right in. I'm going through the first three chapters this week, or this month. So chapter one, In Defense of Everything, chapter two, The Maniac, and chapter three, The Suicide of Thought. I don't expect it to take all too long. I want this to be a pretty digestible, just once a month little thing. I'm just going to give a few notes on each one. The first chapter, In Defense of Everything Else, if you've read much Chesterton, that sounds familiar. He titles a lot of essays and a lot of works, In Defense of X, In Defense of Y. Uh, so in defense of everything else goes with other things you'll hear him write. Uh, he right off the bat explains that it's a companion to his book, Heretics. In Heretics, he is not in defense of anything. He's tearing down other things. And he was charged with the criticism that anyone can tear down. It's much more difficult to put up a positive, this is what is, instead of just taking down, this is what is not. Um, and he just explains that this is his attempt at explaining what is and standing in defense of things rather than tearing them down. And he uses a little uh, uh, metaphor to do that of a man who gets in a yacht, goes out on this firm, wild adventure, and washes up a uh, little while later in England where he left from without realizing it and starts exploring the new shores and isn't exploring long before he realizes that he never left England. Anyone who's read The Ball and the Cross, that's actually a familiar anecdote. He uses that elsewhere, because in The Ball and the Cross, there's a chapter where his, his two characters, uh, McKeon and Turnbull, are on a ship, think they get lost at sea, and they end up finding that they never left England. It's a very similar anecdote to what he uses there. 
Uh, but he ends up saying, what could be more delightful than to have in the same few minutes all the fascinating terrors of going abroad combined with all the humane security of coming home again? This line really the crux of his first chapter. It's a uh, it's what he says we need to look for when we're trying to describe this orthodoxy, what our goal is. And it's defined that delightful place where you're simultaneously experiencing the terror of going abroad while simultaneously the humane security of coming home. He says the answer is found in orthodoxy. And he does, to be fair, at the very end, he defines orthodoxy as uh, abiding by the Apostles' Creed. Uh, chapter one's pretty short. That's about... That's about it. the main into is just, and he's seeking to, like I said, just a review, he's seeking to answer his negative claims with a positive claim. And he's seeking to do so by finding that combination of the terror abroad met with the comfort of home. Uh, and he hopes he finds it in orthodoxy. And then he goes on to start building his case. That's where we get to chapter two, the maniac. Uh, he... He starts out the maniac by explaining that we have all these little aphorisms we tell each other that we use regularly that are completely meaningless. And the example he uses is the man will get on. He believes in himself. And, you know, we tell everybody, go, if you believe in yourself, you're going to be incredibly successful. And that's not true. I mean, there are tons of people who believe in themselves and have absolutely no success. I, I believe in myself tremendously. And yet only three people are going to listen to this podcast. Um, it's, it's not, there's a lot more to life than believing in himself. And he uses the ultimate example of such as a man in, 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 in an insane asylum. Because nobody believes in themselves more than the man in the, in the insane asylum. And he says, the man in the insane asylum often believes in himself more than even Caesar or Napoleon ever did. Yet he never escapes the asylum. But he also is not just making a quippy remark to take down our aphorisms. He's moving particularly to the point of insane asylums because he says that there was a point in history where when we had conversations about orthodoxy, we could use the ultimate starting point as sin exists in the world because even, even the most staunch atheist believes in some way that wrong exists in the world, sin exists in the world. That's a comfortable starting place and we can get to, well, what are the implications of what that sin exists? But he says, you know, today, and by today, he means 1908 today. So very, even more so today, but even in his today, it was an issue that that wasn't necessarily an agreed upon starting point. Not everyone accepts that sin is a, that sin is a agreed upon fact of the world. So with that, he says, for now, at least, we do believe that there do exist people who are insane. For one reason or another, that insanity is something we still somewhat believe. Even, even the person who says there is no sin in the world believes that some people are crazy. So he uses that as his starting point and tries to dive into what is it that makes a man insane. And he talks about a lot how the mathematician very often goes insane while the poet and the artist does not. And his major point he gets at is that the madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. And that's something that correlates a lot to uh, how I said his, his contemporary book he wrote, uh, The Man Who Was Thursday, is a very similar story. And that's because the anarchists in The Man Who Was Thursday are not unreasonable people. They're very reasonable people, but they're starting without any foundation and without any firm ground to stand on. And if you reason from nothing, you will get to madness, which is where the anarchists in The Man Who Was Thursday seem to stand. And that's why he ends up, the the real crux of this one is... Uh, that this chapter is purely practical and is concerned with what actually is the chief mark and element of insanity. We may say, in summary, that it is reason used without root, reason in the void. The man who begins to think without the proper first principles goes mad. He begins to think at the wrong end. And for the rest of these pages, we have to try to discover what is the right end. And that, of course, he's going to go on to argue that that is 
orthodoxy. That is what is the right end. Uh, but without that as a foundation, if you have the most perfect reason in the world, you're going to reason to insane conclusions. Uh, but he also, in order, again, not wanting to do what he did in Heretics, where he just tore down and didn't offer a positive answer, he does take a moment to hint at what the solution is, where he states, but we may ask in conclusion, if this be what drives men mad, what is it that keeps them sane? By the end of this book, I hope to give a definite, some will think a far too definite answer. But for the moment, it is possible in the same solely practical manner to give a general answer touching what in actual human history keeps men sane. Mysticism keeps men sane. As long as you have mystery, you have health. When you destroy mystery, you create morbidity. I particularly love this line because it, uh, to me, it seems like the flip side of another line he uses in his book, Napoleon of Notting Hill, which is personally my favorite book of all time. His character, I'm never going to pronounce it right because I learned it by reading, but his character, Avron Quinn, says, seriousness sends men mad. I, I love that line in particular that, people become too serious and that's what sends them mad. It's an, There's another Chesterton line out there that's angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Very often, unseriousness is Chesterton's solution to things. He's, he's a very whimsical kind of guy, even though he doesn't always write like it. And I've always found that very appealing. So this is kind of the opposite end to seriousness sends men mad is that mysticism keeps men sane. Uh, as we move on to other episodes of this going forward, we'll start getting into the more concrete of what that looks like. But he does touch on it there, and I wanted to make sure to include it. And of course, he also says, because orthodoxy is such a key to it all, that if we are to prevent that that uh, reason without root, and if we are to avoid that seriousness sending men mad, the solution is that the church is the one thing that prevents a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his age. So it is, again, we get a hint at that orthodoxy being the most important part. It is the church that keeps men in that mysticism properly, as opposed to being in it without reason, again, or not without reason, without root, again, finding themselves just in a new level of madness. Then we get into chapter three, which he entitled The Suicide of Thought. And it's here that he really takes on skepticism and relativism. These are his his main things he criticizes here um i'm not going to go through the whole chapter i'm already a good 12 minutes in and i don't want this to be too long of a podcast each month i want it to be pretty reasonably that you could just listen on the ride to and from work but uh i am going to hit it because it is an important chapter he uh his main his main point he gets into is that the source of skepticism is humility as it's been disordered it, uh, it reminds me a lot the way Chesterton talks of something Matt Frad says on Pines with Aquinas a lot where he talks about how porn is so disgusting because it takes something beautiful and disorders it. As Whereas on the flip side, if you were to take trash and kick a pile of trash, it's you haven't made it that much uglier. It was already ugly. It's taking something beautiful and making it ugly that is so deeply uglier. Uh, Chesterton writes a similar thing about humility. He talks about how humility was meant as a restraint upon the arrogance and infinity of the appetite of man. Humility is obviously one of the most important virtues we have, and we look to it often. He said what, what we suffer today, on the other hand, is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that does, that does assert is exactly the part that ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part that he ought not to doubt, the divine reason. And that's really how he goes to divine, define what it is that skepticism and relativism come from and what they are. Uh, he says, we're supposed to be humble and accept the divine reason and accept the truth. And we're supposed to doubt ourselves and ha have humility in ourselves. But he says, what skepticism and relativism have done is flip that on their head, 
where a person says, no, we can't trust the divine reason. We have to be as humble as possible and doubt everything. But in doubting divine reason, the only thing left to assert is yourself because you've now doubted everything outside of yourself. And then his real, real crux of this whole point gets to where the real danger in that skepticism and relativism is, is that the peril is that the human intellect is now free to destroy itself. Just as one generation could prevent the very existence of the next generation by all entering a monastery or jumping into the sea, so one set of thinkers can in some degree prevent further thinking by teaching the next generation that there is no validity in any human thought. If you are merely a skeptic, you must sooner or later ask yourself the question, why should anything go right, even observation and deduction? Why should not good logic be as misleading as bad logic? They're both movements in the brain of a bewildered ape. And there's a great point to that because once you take out the divine reason and you take out God, it's hard to know why anything should be trusted. He describes logic itself as an act of faith because for you to trust your own logic, there must be some reason that your logic works. And this comes to his ultimate point of this chapter, he goes on with some anecdotes about St. Joan of Arc and some other points, but it all comes to his main point that there is a thought that stops thought. That is the only thought that ought to be stopped. That is the ultimate evil against which all religious authority was aimed. So this is his real point where, again, he's bringing it back to orthodoxy and he's talking about religious authority and he's saying one of the most vital points of that religious authority is stopping the thought that stops all thought, which is skepticism and relativism. That sums up chapter three. The next chapters we're going to get into, I'll just tease them right now, are the ethics of Elfland, the flag of the world, and then the paradoxes of Christianity, because it would not be G.K. Chesterton if we weren't talking a little bit about paradoxes. Uh, like I said, this is not going to be a very week-to-week -week podcast. It's going to be very slow and digestible. You could easily read the entire book before the next episode comes out. So if you want, you can wait for the next couple episodes to come out and just have them all come by at once as you read with it. Or read slowly with me or read way ahead and just when the episodes come back, keep your thoughts and hear what I have to say about them. My next episode should be the week after Ash Wednesday and Valentine's Day. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to just do one right after I meet with my local Chesterton Society so I can talk about what we talked about and what I wanted to remember, what I wanted to stick with me, and what I hope will be helpful to you. In the meantime, uh, you can keep up with me at, at Natural Authority, but with no Y at the end because it didn't fit in the character limit on Twitter. Uh, I assume anyone who's listening to this is already following Caleb's Thomas reviews since that's where these podcasts are coming out but if somehow it made your way to it and you have not already followed that subscribe and follow to Thomas reviews uh with that I'll be back like I said a little over a month from or not a little over a month a little over a month from this recording but it'll be about a month after this episode comes out and with that I just wanted to finish with uh the Chesterton Society gives a little prayer for the intercession of G.K. Chesterton uh, with the hopes of him being a saint one day and the prayer for him to be a saint one day. It is a private devotion. If you are underwhelmed by it, just turn the episode off. You don't have to listen. If you really like it, you can find it. I think it was, I got it from Chesterton.org. They give like 10 at a time for you to just get and you can get them for free. You just have to plug in an address you want them shipped. But with that, I'm going to end on that note. And I thank you all very much for listening. In nomine Patri, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. God, our Father, you filled the life of your servant, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, with a sense of wonder and joy, and gave him a faith which was the foundation of his ceaseless work, a charity towards all men, particularly his opponents, and a hope which sprang from his lifelong gratitude for the gift of human life. May his innocence and his laughter, his constancy in fighting for the Christian faith in a world losing belief, his lifelong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and his love for all men, especially for the poor, bring cheerfulness to those in despair, conviction and warmth to lukewarm believers, and the knowledge of God to those without faith. We beg you to grant the favors we ask through his intercession, so that his holiness may be recognized by all, and the church may proclaim him blessed. 
We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In nomine Patri et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Thank you all very much and have a fantastic next month. This concludes our broadcast of Trailer Park Chesterton with Connor Mortel.